And we are back on the Zero Hour. You know, this weekend is Labor Day, as you've no doubt noticed. And here to talk to us about a subject integral to the Labor Day topic is Robert L. Borisaj. He's the founder and president of the Institute for America's Future and co-director of its sister organization, the Campaign for America's Future, with which I am affiliated. Uh, they were launched, but these two organizations were launched launched by 100 prominent Americans to develop the policies, message, and issue campaigns that help forge an enduring majority for progressive change in America. Bob, thanks for joining us. Got to unmute first. My, my pleasure. Good to be here. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, please. We need to unmute the left. That's our message, mission here. <laughs> exactly. So now you've written a new, uh, a, a new study and you, you wrote up a, a blog post about it and you said that you pointed out that here we are paying tribute to Labor Day, but working family incomes haven't gone up in the 21st century. Inequality is reaching new extremes. Corporate profits are reaping a record portion of the nation's income. This is you, of course, while workers' wages wallow at record lows. So we should do more than celebrate workers. We should understand how vital reviving worker unions are to building it is to building a reviving a broad middle class. Why is that? What is the relationship between uh, unions and the middle class in your thinking? Well, that's the thing that's fascinating about this debate we've been having about the declining middle class and the rise of extreme inequality, which is almost the entire mainstream dialogue around it omits the kind of motor force, or at least one of the major engines of building the middle class in the first place, which were uh, very powerful uh, unions, uh, workers organized into unions who could demand uh, and and get uh, decent pay and begin to create the structure of benefits, pensions, and health care that we became were the centerpiece of building a broad middle class. And and what's happened is uh, when we were building that middle class and out of coming out of World War II for three decades, unions were very strong uh, and workers. Uh, shared in the productivity and profits they helped to create, and the society grew together. That is, incomes on the bottom and the middle rose as fast as incomes on the top. Uh, but the uh, success of unions, not their failure, uh, led corporations and the right to launch fierce attacks on them. Uh, and over time, uh, unions have become dramatically weaker. So now they represent less than 7% of the private workforce. They're basically not a factor. And corporations have created uh, strategies with globalization and tax and trade strategies that put workers in uh, you know, competition with low-wage workers around the world. They've perfected ways of trampling the right of workers to organize and effectively eliminated the right to organize in, uh, in this society. Um, and the result is, uh, you can see in what's happened to the middle class. That is, productivity still goes up, profit still goes up, but workers don't share in them. Uh, and in fact, middle class, uh, as, as I said, uh, you know, household incomes haven't increased uh, in the 21st century over the last uh, 14 years. Um, and uh, Profit, corporate profits now are a record share of national income, whereas workers' wages are a record low share. Uh, and this is because, I think, in, in significant degree of the weakness uh, uh, of the success of the campaign to destroy uh, the empowering of workers through unions. And well, the, let's talk uh, about that for a second. If I could just jump in. Uh, we're talking with Robert Boris, the Institute for America's Future, about unions and the middle class. Now, uh, there's been a very, uh, as you know, multi-decade comprehensive campaign against war, uh, war against unions waged on multiple fronts, including the in the political debate. And one of the things they will tell you, the let's say the other side of the corporate side of this debate, is that the shift is not due to the weakening of workers, but rather to what they seem to describe as irresistible or inexorable forces. For example, globalization was inevitable and uh, uh, technological change was inevitable. And they talk about structural unemployment. And they, they say that basically their argument seems to be the workers just aren't as important to the economy as they used to be. And the union business, uh, well, that's causality, getting causality wrong. They just, they don't have power, so they don't need unions anymore because they got nothing to bargain with. Uh, what, what do you say to that? Well, I think that's, that's the mainstream uh, 
dialogue, really, or narrative about uh, how the economy changed. And the problem with it is that it it it's like the dog that didn't bark in the Sherlock Holmes uh, story. Uh, it leaves out uh, the whole question of politics and power. So, you know, technological change was taking place when the middle class was getting built after World War II. And globalization isn't an act of nature. It's a set of policies, tax, trade, uh, uh, financial, uh, monetary policies, uh, where you make choices, and those choices benefit parts of the economy, and they injure others. Uh, we made choices. Multinationals basically wrote our globalization strategy, and they chose to benefit investors, made it easy to ship jobs abroad, made it easier, even easier to threaten to move jobs abroad, uh, and uh, dramatically weakened uh, the ability of workers uh, here at home. But that was a choice. In Germany, they made a very different choice where unions were stronger, and the companies and the unions together uh, navigated uh, a globalization strategy that has made Germany one of the great uh, export powers of the world and allows German workers to uh, sustain middle class incomes and benefits. So so your your point among other things being that Germany which has these these uh policies more favorable to workers exists in the same planet and the same economic forces that we do if they can do it we can do it. We chose not to. You know, you mentioned the Sherlock Holmes story about the dog that didn't bark. I, I'm not sure if I remember that story correctly. The dog didn't bark because it was his master uh, coming in. And um, that gets to the question of the two political parties and corporations. And, uh, you know, we haven't heard a lot of barking, uh, some of us might say, on behalf of the unions and working people in general in Washington, as we might like. Uh, and this gets to the issue of corporate influence in politics. Do Who are the politicians out there who are really making the argument and backing it up with action on behalf of American workers and, and unions? Before we get back to the union topic, which I do want to do. Well, rhetorically, uh, you know, I mean, nothing's happening at the national level because it's just locked up by Republican obstruction. But there's no question that Sherrod Brown, uh, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, uh, the Congressional Progressive Caucus in the House, uh, Keith Ellison, Raul Grijalva, and others have been uh, very uh, articulate and forceful advocates for empowering workers at the workplace. Uh, at the, what's more interesting in some ways, because things can move, is at the state and local level. So, for example, in Los Angeles, elected officials um, in the city council passed uh, laws that used the procurement and zoning uh, powers of the city to force contractors uh, to uh, allow workers to organize in their workplace and to adhere to labor laws. And that made a big difference in the ability of a strong union movement to get even stronger in Los Angeles and to, to start to begin to create middle-class benefits, et cetera. And that's the other point that's so uh, striking in this. You know, people have a sense, well, you know, the jobs have changed. We've got all this contingent labor and part-time jobs, and uh, and we're, we're, we've moved from an industrial economy to a uh, economy of services, and service jobs don't pay well, and, and this is just sort of inevitable. But the reality is no job is inherently marginal. That is simply a question of definition and a question of power. So, for example, in Phoenix, if you're a hotel maid, you make the minimum wage at best, and you have, uh, you're have you at great risk of having a lot of those wages, and certainly your overtime stolen by your employers. You have no union. In New York City, where unions uh, represent uh, the workers who are hotel maids, you can earn $50,000 a year. You get health benefits. You get a pension, and you get regular hours because you have uh, a strong union negotiating at your side. So these things, uh, the strength of unions makes a huge difference. And what's, you know, the corporations get that. That's why they've led the war on them. The right wing gets it at the national level because they know unions have been central when they were strong to all of the reforms that helped, uh, you know, raise the minimum wage, protect Social Security, create Medicare, et cetera, that helped working people. So they went after them as a pillar of the Democratic Party. It seems and the only people who don't get it to some degree are kind of conservative Democrats or new Democrats who decided it was fashionable that uh, unions were outmoded and, and not necessary to the new economy. Well, but that seems to be part of the dialogue now. So I think, you know, uh, and, and I certainly agree with the uh, 
the uh, the great figures, uh, the inspiring figures you mentioned at the national level and certainly the local level, but at the national, uh, let's say at the presidential level, we don't hear a lot of talk about, you know, I go, go back to the 1956 Republican platform where Eisenhower boasted about the number of union jobs he'd created and the number of people he'd put on the Social Security rolls in his first term. Now you don't really even hear Democrats giving a full-throated presidential level endorsement of unions does that mean to get back to your point that a lot of the action is going to be at the state and local level now you think well i think inevitably the action is going to be at the state and local level for a while simply because washington is dysfunctional and the uh, the obstruction of the tea party right uh, has really locked up the congress from doing anything the president on his own in his uh, ability to operate uh, with executive orders has done some things so he issued an executive order that gave contract workers uh, a Ten dollar and ten cent minimum wage, one that they wouldn't pass through the Congress for most workers. He just issued an executive order uh, giving procurement advantage to companies that don't have, that haven't violated labor laws and haven't been convicted of uh, trampling the rights of their workers. Um, and so he's begun the, at least to make some steps uh, with his own pen uh, that uh, can help move this forward. And and I think. One of the things we've got to be demanding as progressives is, one, that unions get put back into the progressive agenda, and two, that where we control uh, government bodies, you know, 28 out of 30 biggest cities are controlled by Democrats, that they start using the power of government to help uh, empower workers to organize at the workplace. You know, at the end of World War II, when unions grew, they grew because uh, government policy helped them to grow under Roosevelt. And they were undermined by government policy under Reagan, Bush's, and the New Dems. And it's going to take government policy, it seems to me, to help them come to help workers come back and to be able to organize once again. And if you can stick with us, Robert Borisage, uh, through this break and maybe talk to us a little more, I want to maybe talk about a plan of action to make that happen and, and, and how we might get there from here. So if you can stick with us, then we'll take a quick break and um, be right back after this and continue this discussion on the role of unions and in ending inequality, reducing inequality and restoring the middle class. Uh, I'm Richard R.J. Eskow, and this is The Zero Hour. And we are back on the Zero Hour. We are talking with Robert L. Borisage, uh, founder and president of the Institute for America's Future and co-director of the Campaign for America's Future about uh, the campaign's new study on inequality and the role of unions in reducing it and restoring the middle class. So, Bob, before we went away, you had mentioned a couple uh, victories that I thought were really uh, important and interesting as we think about kind of how to change the the dynamic here that's been decimating the middle class and and uh, in a related or causal move decimating the union movement um, and that is one of them was the, the two presidential executive orders which uh, helped workers significantly um, and I think in both cases we had on the show Joseph Givargesi who's a uh, worker activist who worked very closely with the uh, Congressional Progressive Caucus we had Representative Keith Ellison on with Joseph to talk about those executive orders. So I think, you know, one of the lessons at the presidential level there was if you have a president that can be touched by the constituency of working people and unions and so on, that really workers need to organize and, and find uh, political alliances and politicians in the electoral system that can work with them. And I think Los Angeles was a similar story. You mentioned uh, the new developments in Los Angeles wasn't worker organization an element, uh, essential element of that as well. Uh, no question, and a lot of it coming from uh, new immigrant workers who were who were eager to gain, uh, you know, put together unions and and uh, be active politically. And you know, you mentioned the new population, the new immigrant workers. This is another interesting area. I mean, as as, as we all look at the union movement and and kind of study it you know there's a popular misconception i think uh probably part of 
almost certainly part of this misinformation campaign on the part of corporations that somehow unions are moribund, they're overly bureaucratic, they're not really thinking in new ways, and they're part of the, this is a new democratic thing, a new dem centrist thing too, that's part of the old way, but the fact is, you know, the more, we've had uh, Richard Trump on the show, we've had other union organizers on the show, we're going to have a uh, railroad, uh, a general secretary of a railroad union, uh, uh, more of a confederation on right after this segment, um, it seems to me that the union movement is actually being very imaginative, and I'll give it credit, a lot of credit, but I'm interested in your thoughts, for reaching out to people like immigrants, uh, home workers, um, and other people who are not members of union now, minimum wage workers, are supporting those in the, for example, the fast food restaurants who rose up and asked for an increase in pay and so on. So uh, is, isn't a, a central part of this strategy, if progressives want to, help restore the re union movement in order to restore the middle class? Isn't an essential part of it sort of educating ourselves about those efforts and supporting them? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think uh, uh, another part is a lot of experimentation. I mean, we've got to find different ways of organizing workers. Uh, unions have to experiment with different ways of reaching out. You've got things like the Restaurant Opportunity Center, which has begun to rep represent uh, women who... Uh, work as waiters and waitresses in restaurants who get a paid a minimum wage that's I don't I can't remember 275 or some uh, preposterous notion uh and it started to do uh, minimum wage drives that would apply to those kinds of workers not exclude them from when the minimum wage gets uh, lifted and I think there's going to be you know this is it's very hard to turn this around uh, and it's going to take a lot of experimentation to do that. The, the thing that's fascinating, though, is even though unions are almost non-existent in the workforce, seven percent is pretty; low, it's close to zero uh, in the private workforce. Uh, workers, if they had the right to organize without getting uh, trampled by employers, would organize. That is, they understand the need to have a collective voice at the workplace. Uh, to stand up for them simply in terms of whether they can get regular hours out of an employer, or whether they can keep their wages from overtime from being stolen, you know, whether they can enforce uh, the safety regulations that are nationally uh, laws but don't get enforced or get ignored by employers. They uh, understand uh, instinctively the need and the importance of having representation. And our problem as a country is we've basically uh, allowed uh, corporations to uh, systematically destroy the ability of workers to, uh, to organize by trampling the rights that they, in theory, have under, in law. Well, you know, and that gets to, I guess, what the final, my uh, final topic is I just wanted to briefly explore with you, which is, you know, the South American educator once talked, used to write about internalizing the oppressor consciousness, how people just get despair, uh, fall into despair and just assume that, that the, uh, the person who's keeping them down is right and they're wrong. And, and, uh, you know, that takes many forms, but it seems to me in, in, in the union movement or in the movement that should be leading to worker organization, there's this sense that, well, we don't really have any power, we can't make a difference, or even worse, that somehow uh, the dialogue has shifted to the idea that what's really hurting our economy is the worker who gets a decent pension or the bus driver who makes a decent living wage, that somehow those are the guys Oh, we've got to go at the men and women we've got to go after rather than the excessive accumulation of wealth at the top 0.01% or, or uh, in corporate, uh, uh, you know, safes or whatever. Um, any thoughts on how to shift that political and sort of cultural uh, dialogue towards something more optimistic and, and I would argue more realistic? Well, I think some of that started to shift already. That is Occupy in many ways transformed that and challenged that debate and that perspective. And it put on the table the fact that the 1% was not only collecting all the income and wealth of the society, but they had rigged the rules so that it they benefited them and, and not the rest of us. And I think that has begun a debate that has reached pretty far, in the remarkably far into the uh, society about uh, this notion that uh, the few are, are, are rigging the game with money and with their influence, uh, 
and have got to be stopped. The the harder question I think now is: Do people uh, are people hopeful? Do they have uh, are they hopeful enough that it's possible that they start to uh, experiment with uh, ways to challenge? And, and I think we've seen the beginnings of that with the fast food walkouts. We've seen the beginnings of that with uh, the uh, the different kinds of strikes of federal workers demanding a decent wage, um, and and some of that is simply people push to the limit, and so they have no choice but to, to demonstrate. And some of it is an increasing sense that this is just not fair, not right, and uh, and that they've got to stand up and, and uh, protest it. And hopefully we have to spread that spirit, and, and then we have to elevate the examples of where workers uh, have, in fact, uh, been able to make a difference. So the Seattle, you know, $15 minimum wage, the the, what's happened in Los Angeles and San Francisco with building uh, uh, labor codes that actually uh, help workers gain living wages. Um, this is all stuff that's just beginning, uh, but that if we can keep having victories at the local level and advertising them across the country, can begin to counter this sense of despair. And I think your report goes a certain way, uh, a long way toward uh, addressing that too, and providing some theoretical background at least for that. So, uh, where can people go to read it? Uh, go to our website, uh, ourfuture.org, www.ourfuture.org. Uh, it's right on the front page, uh, and uh, uh, we hope people will use it, uh, spread it around, uh, make sure that lots of people uh, talk about it and read about it. This ought to be a drumbeat. And we ought to make sure that uh, any progressive, any reformer, uh, as a first order of business, uh, includes rebuilding the right of workers to organize and bargain collectively as the centerpiece of, of their reform agenda. All right. Well, Robert L. Borisage, Director of the Institute for America's Future, Co-Director of Campaign for America's Future, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure.